Great. Well, it is uh, my great pleasure to uh, introduce my colleague and friend, Professor Christian Barden. Uh, professor Barden is a, an associate professor in the Department of Communication and Journalism. And for the last seven years, we've had neighboring offices. So we uh, have many chats about um, nonsense and interesting things. Um, Christian is going to, uh, you can come here now, I think, Christian, if you want. And I will do, uh, oh, enable editing. Mm -hmm. And I will do this for you. And uh, so, um, Professor Barden, <laughs> the floor is yours. Maybe if I put that there, then you can like wave your hands around. OK, well. uh, waving my hand around sounds fun. Thank you all for being here. And thanks, Nick, for the nice introduction. Ah. OK. Great to see you all here, and, and, and thanks again, Nick, for the uh, nice introduction. I'm not a sociologist. Uh, currently, today, I'm, I, I'm here as a methodologist. So as a methodologist, when people come with new technology that evokes fear or that evokes um, questions about like potential eternal bliss, the reflex of a methodologist is to untangle things and to try and see what is inside, what is generative AI really, what does it really do, and what can we learn from this? So what I would, I'm trying, going to try to do here now in the next, what, 15, 20 minutes or so, is to draw a bit on a historical analogy. Maybe you can already see it coming. Um, to try and kind of ask a few critical questions about AI that I think are worth thinking about. And the historical analogy on which I built here, the, uh, me the mechanical American, uh, obviously, um, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with Brent Spiner playing uh, Lieutenant Commander Data, he is, uh, plays an android, an artificial human that struggles to be human, but eventually, well, don't watch the latest season, uh, the latest, uh, latest thing, but like eventually has to recognize that there are still limitations to being a human machine. The analogy is the mechanical Turk. That thing is a machine that is now a bit over uh, 250 years old. It uh, was constructed by Wolfgang von Kempelen, a Hungarian uh, inventor, and it was a chess automaton that shocked and fascinated the world because this machine was capable of playing chess and beating a reasonably experienced player. That is something that we have not achieved again for the next 240 years. But the trick here, of course, was that there was a human insight. So the mechanical, mechanical Turk was a fraud. And in the next few minutes, I'm not going to argue that AI is a fraud, but there are some important analogies between what we have seen with the mechanical Turk and the public reception that it has received, the excitement, the modernity that was projected into this machine, the coming age of automation, and where we are today. So if we start with the Mechanical American, made by Google, Facebook, Microsoft, OpenAI, and others in different years and different, um, different versions, I'm going to basically argue that there are a lot of uh, kind of things that remind us of this particular situation. To do this, I'm going to start with GPT, because I think GPT is actually, much, actually a much better name for the thing that we are talking about than artificial intelligence. I don't think artificial intelligence is particularly artificial, and I don't think it is particularly intelligent, whereas GPT actually captures quite nicely what this is. You all know what GPT stands for, I assume? Do you? No? Who wants to give me a letter? Generative, yes, we have generative, we have pre-trained, and the T is the transformer. So this is the, T, the three elements of what this is really doing. There is a pre-trained algorithm, so it is based on data, and it includes information about the world. It uses a transformer model in order to kind of store this information in a way that is efficient and lends itself to use in all kinds of applications, and it uses this data in order to generate. Right? So let's look at these letters one by one, starting by pre-trained, because that's the first thing that happens in a process. And my point here would be that there is still a human inside, or actually quite a lot of humans. Nick already earlier uh, referred to all the AI workers, but all the training material, all the stuff that AI learns from is human-made. 
with the possible exception of what we just heard about the idea of kind of training AI on based on AI stuff, what could possibly go wrong, right? Um, so we can probably create some kind of recursive ripples that just kind of as a quick aside reminds me of a little episode from a few years ago when uh, in Germany there was a new, I'm German by the way, uh, in Germany a new minister was kind of brought into office. He had very, very many names. He was called Karl Theodor Maria Nikolaus Johann Jakob Philipp Franz Josef Sylvester Bullfreier von und zu Gutenberg. And somebody on the day before his inauguration did the joke of put, giving him an extra name on Wikipedia. On the next day, obviously, all the newspapers that had referred to Wikipedia for, all the for the name had this extra name, which was fake. Afterwards, Wikipedia rolled back the change because it was clearly misinformation. And editors protested, citing said newspapers as evidence that their information was correct. So, so there is something quite absurd about the idea of training AI based on AI output. but. In the end, everything that we see goes back over one or two or three generations to what humans have created. And these are not just any humans. These are weird humans. You may be familiar or not familiar with this acronym, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and developed uh, nations, weird nations. So we know that the kind of the data, the training data that the training data that AI works on is predominantly Western. It imagery stock imagery represents predominantly white people doing predominantly things that Western white people do. Um, the same thing is for the text. Um, there is a lot of content on AI that is not necessarily English, but AI processes English way better than other languages. Why? There's a number of reasons. One of them has to do that there is just way more of this content that is available to developers. And since the model learns from experience, it is way more experienced in processing English language text, but there are also other reasons, linguistic differences, other kind of challenges, and also the use cases which continue to train AI are predominantly in the English-speaking West by people like us who ask ChatGPT in English, because if you ask it something in Hebrew, you will be amazed at the hilarity of the results. These weird humans create weird content in both in the sense that this is predominantly about stuff that Western people care about, that people in the global north care about, that educated white people care about, but also in the sense that there is a lot of content that is of precarious quality. We've already heard about fake news, we've heard about all kind of other content that can be used if uh, that may sh uh, surface if, uh, uh, if AI is trained on, on available data. And we need to invest quite a bit of effort to, say, for instance, train AI in order to make sure that if you ask, for instance, a uh, chatbot why everything is the fault of the Jews, it won't give you the conspiracy theory, right? Because the conspiracy theory is clearly represented in the training data that it has. So we need to tell the computer that this is maybe not the most reliable source of information. This is actual work. So we need to unweird the content, and we need to somehow strike a balance between the good stuff that we think about, right, like the kind of quality information that is in these training data, and all the other stuff, which is a very weird mix of knowledge controversy. Controversy generates a lot of text. So whenever there is controversy in society over it, it tends to be overrepresented in training data. There is a lot of stereotype, half knowledge, half which there is a lot of moderation. This is the AI work that Nick was referring to, and there's plain bullshit. And the plain bullshit is learned by the AI just as much as everything else. And if we are not watching out, it will spit it back at us. Let's talk a little bit about the T, the transformer. That's the technology in the AI. The transformer is basically a pattern extraction, pattern reproduction mechanism. It is a very, very sophisticated one. Right? I'll easily give you that. But in the end, what it mostly does is it tries to extract patterns from the observations that it has. And it tries to find efficient ways of encoding them so it can make them usable for other applications. Which means, if you recognize the movie here, the, the robot is essentially trying to mimic what we are doing. It's not trying to think. It is trying to emulate. That's an important difference. 
because it means that the quality of the training data very precariously predetermines what AI can and cannot do. So if humans are biased, the AI will learn the bias. If humans do stupid things, and when has that ever happened, the AI will learn stupid things. If, uh, if humans have particular um, uh, like attention preference or like kind of focus more, attend more to certain problems, the AI will think that these problems are more important and more worthy of attention. So there is a lot of kind of biases that we encode into this entire system. What we do in the fine-tuning stage of the AI is mostly to define the success. So we have basically a trained monkey here that is trying to emulate what we are doing, and we are giving it rewards or not giving it rewards depending on our target functions. And the AI, the only thing that it really does is kind of, in a way, optimizing conditional probabilities, right? Like, if, you, if I give you this kind of response, this is likely to kind of be met with a reward. Uh, if I give you this search result, that's kind of the old-fashioned AI, right? That's kind of the Google search engine. What kind of page can I give back to you that is most likely to make you click? and make you click happy and make you click again, right? So it's basically, it's mostly optimizing conditional probabilities, anticipating what we will want, not what is the correct answer to the problem. Let's think about the generative process that is in here. In a way, you could say we're still playing chess. That's the, um, sometimes you're playing a game of trivial pursuit. That means that there is actually a correct answer out there. There is information in the training data. And what we try to do is to get the machine to find and reproduce this. It can do this if the answer is in the training data, sufficiently salient, not marked by controversy as contested, and a number of other criteria. But it is capable of doing this. But whenever there is not really a correct answer, and that is something you can test very nicely if you give GPT the, the task to write your essays or whatever, right? Then it's basically playing blackjack. It kind of it pulls a next plausible thing that kind of fits nicely in the sentence after the one that it just imagined. Whether that thing makes sense is a completely different question. So the AI is not really trying to optimize sense, it is trying to optimize probabilities, and that is not necessarily the same thing. Which means that AI can beat humans if the task that we give to it has a known answer or followed a predictor uh, procedure. So if we have, for instance, procedures for implementing ideas into design studies, right? If we have, uh, if we have procedures for evaluating the quality of a, of a model or something. AI is brilliant at that because We've done this many times manually, and that's the necessary condition. If we have done this many times in principle, if the knowledge is available in principle, we can train AI to do this, if it has sufficiently often observed this. But this mechanism is not intelligence, and the nicest way of showing this is if you use these image generation AIs. They do stuff that makes sense on a local level, but it doesn't make sense as a whole. There is a lot of uh, kind of improvisation that AI pulls whenever the procedure, the correct procedure, the correct answer is not just a retrieval task, an information retrieval task, but it is actually a creative task because that is not what it does. So mistaking AI for creative is, I think, a grave mistake. AI can generate because we generate it. It retrieves, it extrapolates, it combines, it evaluates. That's what it's good at. But it is always stuck and is always limited by what we have given it. It can, it can do the thing that we have done more often, again, louder, in new applications, but it cannot innovate. We like to ignore this. And this is the last analogy with the Mechanical Turk. We still enjoy being fooled. We still enjoy this kind of imaginary of the AI that can take over the world, or this kind of nice tingling fear of like, you know, the AI taking over the world. In my experience, AI would probably accidentally take over the wrong world. Um, it might happen, right? But this is not really what we're looking at. And that's why I think that AI is a bit of a misnomer. It's basically, it's a trick. It's a kind of a mechanism. And it makes sense to think of it as a mechanism because that's really what is under the hood. It's a mechanism that is incredibly useful and it can do really cool things, right? Like, I mean, like my coding skills have gone up amazingly since somebody invented the co-pilot, right? 
This is really useful because I'm reproducing, but I cannot write new code like codes that hasn't been thought of before. I can only write code with a copilot that has been thought of before. So it is limited, and that means that AI can save us a lot of work that we could also do. It would just take us forever, provided that we know what we're doing. But AI is neither very artificial, nor it is particularly intelligent. And that means that if we treat AI as intelligent, we risk opening floodgates to bias, to failure, to abuse of all kinds. So don't entrust your innovation process to AI. Don't entrust your democracy to AI. Don't entrust your life to AI. Use AI in the job, but stay in control of it, because that's what it is. It's a mechanism. Thank you very much. Is this on? Yeah. Uh, when you invite people to give talks, you don't always know if it's going to be brilliant. Uh, but thank you, Christian. That really was fantastic. Uh, uh, questions? Um, I want to ask about what you said. Um, if you're sure that it's not applicable to humans, because we're copying patterns and we're just using a lot of more sen uh, sensors of the world and knowledge about the world uh, to do it, but we just mimic each other and we just um, learn from um, experience like, and biases and a uh, lot more. And why do you think that there's a really a, um, something that blocks the, the AI, the, uh, the GPT to, uh, to go to much bigger creative things or uh, knowledge? All is, I, get, I think that all it needs is more sensors, more uh, knowledge about the world, more models to abstract uh, anomalies and uh, patterns from the data, abstractive uh, patterns, and just apply to, uh, uh, to creative things. Because mm -hmm. creative is just taking things from uh, uh, one uh, field or domain and Extracting the, I guess, extracting the um, um, the model and apply it to new thing, new knowledge, new domain. Yeah, thank you very much. That's, uh, I mean, like, that's basically where the idea with AI comes from, right? Like this kind of psychological, like developmental psychology metaphor that basically assumes that we acquire the knowledge that we have based on observation, pattern recognition, pattern extrapolation, and pattern repetition. Right? And that basically, in a way, understands creativity as a variant of extrapolation. Right? Like kind of you collide thoughts that exist in the world and smash, you get something new. To some extent, that may be true. I'm not sure whether this is just a matter of more sensors. There's a number of reasons for that. One is that basically the way in which we understand things is different. So like if you observe children acquiring knowledge by observation and mimicry and whatever, they have a very fast, very intuitive understanding of objects as things, as wholes. That's something that we really struggle with in AI to teach. Right? There's a reason why, for instance, if you look at like transformer models, why they cut even words that are, make perfect sense into these kind of weird little tokens right? that are kind of senseless because the statistical model feels more comfortable with distributions. It feels more comfortable with like conditional probabilities and all these things. So it doesn't really think in objects. So, but objects are instrumental to a way of reasoning, right? to a way of evaluating things. So we don't, if we are trying to kind of check whether an idea makes sense, we are not evaluating a statistical probability. We are involving empathy, we kind of, we put ourselves into the shoes of somebody using something. We imagine how this would, how this imagined object would exist in our world. If we can define the goal for which we are using a particular thing, then we are back in the evaluation box. That's the thing that AI is very productively applied to these days. Somebody has a cool idea, and then you can ask AI to simulate users of this according to known parameters, because Known parameters are basically what we operate on, right? But the imagining things is more difficult to imagine. It is conceivable that, I think, and it is conceivable that an AI can learn how to generate ideas that are worth evaluating. 
it is conceivable that it can evaluate some of them in, in, in terms of what it, uh, what it knows. We are very, very far from that. And it will be a stochastic process if AI does this. And if there is one thing that I can tell you about stochastic processes involving billions and billions of data points, is it will go very wrong very, very many times before it hits anything. Hi, thank you for, uh, for the talk. Uh, I was wondering, what if the AI is a mechanism? What are the great dangers that all the AI companies are now worried? I heard there is a, a petition that they're saying that we need to have more uh, legalization over AI. That's one question. And the second question is, uh, what do you think about truth in the world of AI? Is truth going to be very statistical from now on? Let's say a lie that has enough sources is now going to be uh, recopied as AI as truth. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, thanks a lot. These are easy ones, huh? <laughs> <laughs> OK, let's start with the dangers. Um, I think from my point of view, the main danger that I can currently perceive in relation to AI is that we overestimate it. I think that basically giving tasks to AI that AI is not fit to do is something that can create real damage. Like we've seen already a number of cases of this, right? Like in the Netherlands, the government had to resign over an AI-based decision process that allocated child, child benefits because the AI did what AI does. It learned that people with dark skin color aren't quite as trustworthy and deserving as people with white skin color. Nobody criticized that. Somebody noticed, and the minister had to go. Right? So um, that's a classic case of deploying AI for something that we should have absolutely not done. And there are many things like this. Right? There are quite a lot of uh, situations where I think we're currently experiencing a hype where it feels like, yeah, AI can do this. You can do this on a personal level when you hand in your essay written by GPT. This is a bad idea. If you don't believe me, try it. Um, <laughs> But we can do this on a societal scale, right? We can, make le we can make decisions at a societal scale using AI in ways that can be catastrophic. I think that is a big problem. Truth comes into this in a way, although I have to say I'm less worried about fake news as a particular phenomenon. The challenge is more like, I mean, basically, this debate about fake news and truth kind of reminds me a little bit of a debate that communication science had like 100 years ago. There was a guy called Walter Lippmann, you may have heard of, American journalist who perceived kind of a similar situation to what we have today. There's like the penny press is new, right? Out of a sudden, first time in history, every American has access to written text about something that is news-ish. Sounds familiar, right? And this news is full of conspiracy theories, sensationalism, bullshit, uh, hyper hysteria, and whatnot. So there is this acute feeling that this is kind of deluding the masses, it's turning the masses into a dangerous mob unable to govern. And the reflex that comes, and Lippmann, Lippmann writes about this, is to try and govern, rein this in, by putting in the experts, right? Like, kind of say, like, okay, there need to be some kind of council of experts that decides what's the good information, what's the bad information, so we can tag everything that's bad information. Sounds familiar, right? That's fact checking, right? Just like 100 years old, but it's basically the same general idea. This idea failed miserably because people don't take very well to being told what information they are supposed to believe and what they're not supposed to believe by old white men that live somewhere in Washington and get a salary that is considerably higher than their own. That is still true. So in a sense, the, 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 the kind of the, um, the, the response that we eventually got to, and this was already uh, mentioned by one of the panelists earlier, um, I think there is something about the cultural adaptation process that is going, that's going on that is going to take care of this. Where we, we already learned that not everything that Trump tweets is news. That was a hard lesson to learn, but we learned it. Thank God, right? And um, this is likely to continue, and we need to try and kind of facilitate this. This is, I think, part of our job here as academics understanding the problem and in being involved in this. The truth question is one step bigger, because it is conceivable that we could try and give artificial intelligence systems access to verification modes that are beyond text. At present, 
all this kind of automated fact checking is basically a correlation check, right? Like, do most texts that we know are normally right-ish kind of agree with this statement? So if the New York Times and Washington Post and LA uh, whatever Times agree with it, it's a fact. And if they don't, it's not a fact. That's a really dangerous way to go down because it has a lot of problems built in that are uh, kind of that repli replicate elitist perspectives and whatnot, right? Some kind of information could probably be fed into AI to facilitate AI's making decisions about what seems like, you know, kind of seems at least backed by experience or backed by, inf by information beyond the text. That, of course, will also be gamed. That has always been the case, right? Rumor is not an invention of the 21st century. That's an old thing. So I think in the end, the matter of kind of uh, deciding on the truth will be something that the cultural process, our use of AI will have to be in control of. We cannot fully externalize this. We can use AI as a tool in this, but we can't depend on AI doing this. We are going to move on to the next thing. Um, Professor Barton, thank you very much for your time and expertise. That was great.